Can you say something? So it'll. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Essential Skills for Difficult Conversations. I'm going to wait a couple of seconds just for everybody to log on and to join us. And uh, for any of you ad hoc, if there's someone who you think may benefit from being part of this conversation, send them a note, tell them to come on. Uh, can't do it with a live event, but certainly can do it with an online event. So here it is. And um, I'm just really, really happy that you're all joining me for Letters from Esther Life, which is my monthly series that helps you reflect and act and gain confidence and relational intelligence in all your relationships. So this is a monthly series. It happens on YouTube and on Facebook Live. And if you want any more information, from me about those letters, just go to estherperel.com slash blog and join us, basically join us every month on YouTube or Facebook to discuss the newsletter live. So you read it and then we discuss it. Remember once we used to learn like that. Submit your questions either in the chat box right here or just after you listen, uh, anywhere you want of where the videos are archived. So let's ground ourselves. Big arms, big hug, big circle that welcomes and includes all of us. Then we will do the hug to ourselves. Big virtual, personal and collective hug. Hmm. All right, let's go. You know, in times like these, what do I mean by in times like these? Prolonged uncertainty, a pandemic, restricted travel, closed schools, job losses, social and economic upheavals. Turbulent times generally will exacerbate our opinions and our coping styles. They will make them more extreme. And I'm sure that many of you have noticed that all the divisions that we are seeing in the society at large are literally sitting next to us at the dinner table. The closer the people, sometimes the harder to have the conversations with. You know, what are the most frequent topics that are causing tensions for you at this moment at your dinner table? I would love to know. With your partner, with your friends, with your family. Can, you, can I just ask you and quickly send us your answers in the chat? I just want to get a sense. Where do you feel like you're about to burst when you have a conversation? What are the really charged topics? Go ahead, just share it with me, it would be lovely. And also make sure you have a pen and paper right there next to you because some of the things you're gonna to write to me and some of the things you're gonna share with each other. So, um, but I don't see anything come into my chat. So I don't know if you're not answering me or if it's me who's not seeing it. Um, team? If you want, you can help me on that one. But, you know, pay attention for a second. These very charged conversations, you find them productive, you find them unbearable. I mean, kind of how bad does it get, right? Is there someone at your table who is constantly pontificating and needs to be the authority on everything? Is there someone at your table who refuses to listen to any other point of view? Is there someone at your table who plays the devil advocate consistently and just picks the one thing, you know? Is there someone at your table who systematically starts to cry? Oh, anti-racism work for white people, political, my ex-husband, parenting, finance, finance, racism to share with the kids, everything from political to local and social issues to home repairs, just about anything, trust issues, wearing a face mask. Okay, we got it. We're on the same page. It's exactly the things that I'm thinking are creating the, the, the difficult conversations of the moment, you know? Um, how challenging, uncertainty of the future, family secrets emerging. Yes, that's a big one. Personal boundaries, how to say I need space also without it being a rejection of another person. How challenging is it for you to be close to people whose worldviews are different from your own. I think that this is one of those difficult conversations, you know, how 
At the same time, many of the debates, these things that you've just mentioned at the dinner table, they are the ones that are happening in the public square and they are the ones that are happening in your bedrooms and they are the ones that are happening at the tables with your family members, your partners, your children, your colleagues, your bosses, just about everywhere. You know, this is a very rife, but also ripe time to have conversations. Now, when I say this is a good time, the fact is that for all of history, people have disagreed with each other about religion, about politics, about social justice, about what is permitted, what is forbidden, what should be taboo, what should be um, uh, legislated by law versus what should be determined individually. I mean, these are questions that we have always had a divergence of opinion on and multiple opinions forever. So while there is a certain kind of charge in this moment, it's not the first time that we're dealing with this thing. In fact, it's not the first time for me either. I was thinking when I was young, teenager in college, for sure. I remember vividly, I could not have a political conversation with my parents, particularly with my mother. By the end, I would be screaming. I would be rushing from the table. My mother would tell me, you are impossible. It's just not possible to have a conversation with you. And I would say, but do you hear what you're saying? And my father would say, she never said that. And I would say, how can you say that? Did you hear what she said? And this was the brawl every single time we would try to have conversations about politics, about the abortion laws in Belgium, about the Middle East at the time, about the, whatever was the big issue um, of the day, it was, it was charged. So I am quite used to intense screaming for some way, political conversations. And the funny thing is that five minutes later, we would continue to talk about past the beef. Like it was done, we went back into the, the normal gist of thing. Um, I think that in this moment, if I was to add a few of those, you know, there is the pandemic, the demonstrations on the street, if love can conquer all, if interracial marriages would actually make for a better world, if a Me Too denunciation should rest on the statement of the victim alone, if you can be a good person and a racist, on the interpretation of American history, people are can have a, a very virulent conversation, whether to wear a mask or not, you've just said that one, whether online learning can be just as productive and effective as in person, same with online working, if kids should go back to school, if we should go back to our offices, if we should take that trip we wanted, if grandma and grandpa should meet the new baby, and why our partner can't do the damn dishes. I mean, this is it, right? It's about the, the if we think in this particular moment, July 2020, what are some of the charged conversations? I think this is a rather um, conclusive tableau, if I could say. So we're going to do a few exercises um, that I think are going to give us some of those essential skills. But before that, I did the exercise myself as well in a beautiful um, experience that I had last month on Share the Mic, where I kind of offered the platform to uh, Yvette Noel Schur, who is the publicist of Beyonce, runs the Beyonce Foundation, also was the publicist of Prince. And basically, we started with a whole conversation about immigration, about being in cross-cultural and interracial marriages, about raising children in a foreign culture. And it was an incredible experience to really meet somebody that I had never known, heard about. Neither of us had ever heard about each other and neither of us really knew why we were partnered together. And to actually be curious and let the things reveal themselves in terms of our differences and our similarities. Um, and it reminded me, you know, the first 20 years of my career, I worked with intercultural, interracial, and interreligious families. So these issues were front and center for me. You know, is a marriage between two individuals or two families? What is at stake in conversion, in baptism, in circumcision? Is a Christmas tree a religious or a cultural symbol? Can you say, do what's right for you without it having an effect or thinking about the effect that it has on the other people? You know, can you feel racism or rejection inside a family and not take it personal? You know, what do you do when someone says it's not personal? <laughs> you know, so I'm not new to these questions and to the conversation that I had with Yvette that I found most enlightening and that I wrote about quite a bit in the newsletter. So, you know, 
um, what we spoke about is kind of how, how do you remain curious? How do you actually not ask somebody, how can you think about this? But instead you ask them, how did you come to think about this? Did you always think this way? Have your views evolved about this topic? Do you think alike to the people who raised you? Those are the, the messages and the beliefs that were handed down to you, or did you form them yourself? Is a stance of curiosity that can help us a great deal when we start to feel the tension in our gut of like, I can't, I don't think I'm gonna be able to sit here much longer and to continue to, to listen to this. So take your piece of paper a second. I'm gonna put four questions in front of you. So let's look at the slide for a moment. Pick one and take the next three to the next dinner conversation. So just pick one for now, the one that seems most relevant to you. What are some of the messages that you grew up with in your family or in the people who raised you about those that are different from you, that could be living on the same block, going to the same school, living in the same building for that matter. What was it that you were told about others, those that are not like us? For a variety of reasons, they live in bigger places, smaller places, they look like us, they don't look like us, they worship like us, they don't worship like us. The basics, I think everybody grows up with messages about otherness. So that's first question. And how similar are your views today about social, racial, religious, lifestyle issues, food for that matter, basic values that you, that you consider important to your family? How much do you identify or versus how much do you separate yourself when it comes to those essential aspects of worldview? And what would you say are the parts of your identity that have been assigned to you? The things that were handed down to you, passed on, legacy parts of your identity. And what would you say are parts of your identity that you have chosen? Pick one of those questions, write it down, and then also share it with me in the chat box. I just would love to see which one of these questions actually grabs you and, uh, and what are the specifics? I'm gonna just be quiet for a moment and let you do this. I, by the way, I'm sure that each of these questions would make for a terrific dinner conversation with strangers, with friends, with family members. I've tried them, so I promise they're vetted. And I'm waiting to read some of these answers in the chat box. And one thing that I find really helpful in these exercises is also to acknowledge the culture in which they take place. Is it a culture of debate or a culture of dialogue? These conversations, these messages, you know, where they, are they presented in order to be right, to be combative, to prove that the other person is wrong, to win the conversation, or to listen for flaws, counter arguments? Do people present opinions as if they are truths? Do they seek to ratify their positions? That's all debate. Being right, combative, winning, counter arguments, confusing assumptions and opinions with truths, all of that is debate. Versus dialogue. Are we talking in order to come up with a shared understanding? A shared understanding of what are the complicated issues at stake in this question? Because de facto, nobody is fully, fully right. Are we aiming for some collaborative understanding, for exploring common ground? Are we listening to understand, to find meaning, to find agreement rather than to find flaws and to counter argue? Are we listening 
to reevaluate our assumptions, to see if there's something that you are saying that actually would make me think. I may not change my mind, but I could reevaluate my assumptions. Am I listening in order to prove my point, which means I'm not listening? Or am I listening in order to actually develop my point further? Maybe I will actually feel it stronger, but it will come through the dialogue with you. Am I looking for new options? I can't emphasize enough the importance of the distinction between a culture of debate and a culture of dialogue. So questions three and four are the most relevant. Messages about people who are different from me. Different means bad, irresponsible in my family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the word difference is often not neutral at all. It means not like us and not like us often means lesser than us um, or different from us in such a way that we can never bridge the gap. That also, it's like, it's too different. Um, but difference is a word that is filled with nuances and subtexts about difference. It's, a, it's a, an amazing word. Difference often conjures up conflict. Difference on conjures up we cannot be close, as if it's a gap, a tension, a space that in between, pollution, you know, irreconcilable difference. There's always the word irreconcilable, you know, um, that is so quickly attached to it. Um, but three and four, the parts of your identity that have been assigned to you and the parts of your identity that you have chosen, the places where you have your own sense of self-determination, agency, with authorship, and the places where you realize that you carry legacy stuff, which you sometimes agree with and which you sometimes can't get rid of, but, don't, but know that it no longer makes sense for you, but you feel it. So we have a slide also of debate and dialogue, just so that you get a sense of it, you know? Um, how did you come to make this decision versus I can't believe that's what you did. That's who you voted for. One is basically a complete, you know, wiping off of the other person. And the other is willing to say there is maybe some validity, some good thinking, some reason, something I can understand about you for why you acted in such a way that I would think is completely, you know, irresponsible or out of my out of my my worldview if you want a question a question about the understand that leads you to understand the other person is often really really useful and i'll tell you where i learned it i learned it when i hitchhiked for years i hitchhiked when i way back but i also did cross this country back and forth hitchhiking a while back and I spoke with people that I probably today would be probably too prejudiced to speak with because I think that I know where they're coming from. Whereas at the time I knew nothing about them. And so I was totally curious. Neither did they know anything about me, neither did they know where Belgium was, but they picked me up and they took me from one state to another. And I remember that that is probably one of the most pure states of curiosity that I had with people that I probably shared so little with except the magnitude of our humanity. It's that thing that I'm trying to instill in us in order to have conversations that are challenging and difficult. The research of Howard Markman is phenomenal about this. It's when you disagree with someone, 10 seconds is about as much as we can tolerate hearing. And if what they're talking about is us, it's really 10 seconds. It means three sentences before we shut down we get flooded and all we do is think about the rebuttal. So it's very, very interesting to stay connected to the other person. And it's a real challenge how we stay in touch with our own integrity and at the same time maintain the connection to people that we sometimes love dearly but can't believe that they think the way they do or act the way they do. But it's the same person who also came to watch us at the game all those years and gave us cookies and gave us beautiful Christmas gifts. And, you know, it's, it's that. It's really making a connection between that which keeps us connected to the person 
and also that which keeps us connected to ourselves. How do you make sure, that's another one, not to confuse feeling really strongly about something with being right, so that it's clear that this is an opinion. Nobody knows sometimes, especially about those big questions that we all ask. And if you need to take a break, find something else to talk about. Don't stay in the conversation and just say, don't just say, you know, we need to agree to disagree. But just to say, this is a difficult conversation for us to have. We really have strong views about this and we're really having a hard time making room for both. So, so we talk about, you know, the quality of the, the bread that's on the table, basically. Connect with something else, leave it, because then you don't stay stuck in it. Create movement, create air, create space. Then if you want, you can come back. So there's another other exercise I wanna ask you to do. It's a letter exercise that I love to do in my, with my patients that I did recently actually with my husband for a program called This Human Moment with Keith Yamashita, which uh, I'm sharing the link with you too, because I think it's a beautiful program that helps us with the reckoning of the moment. And I was writing a letter on the back of my husband in an effort to cross a bridge. And then I thought, I want to do that also with people that I really need really to cross a bridge. But sometimes it is my husband too. You know, crossing the bridge to go and visit the other person on the other side. It's a beautiful metaphor that I received from my mentor, Hedy Schleifer. And when you cross that bridge, you have to leave yourself behind on the other side. You really need to be able to move on to the, you know, to this side and really visit with full attention. And what is it that I need to do in order to be able to remain remotely open to you in this moment of high stress, you know, Write it, write it by hand. See all the people here who talked about the personal boundaries, the wearing the face mask, the this, the that. Instead of talking about the issue that you disagree with, your letter is about the connection, the challenge to it, the resentment, the depletion, the despair, the loneliness. I think the majority of the time when you are totally disconnected in a difference of opinion with somebody that you're very close to, you actually feel really alone. It severs the connection. It's ex experienced as this, this breach like that. Write the letter by hand. What I haven't, what I've wanted to tell you, what has been really sad for me, what I think must be really hard for you, what you, you know, that kind of letter, small, three sentences, don't make it a long, long novel, you know, but reaching out to the other person. And, you know, anybody who does exercise that requires reaching, you always are told, reach a little bit more, a little bit more. There is always another small space that you didn't even know you could get to. It's that kind of letter that I would like you to write. And then understand that when you have disagreement, conflict, major differences of values, you still want to be able to experience a kind of peace with the people that are close to you in particular. Those you work with, those you live with, those you raise, all of that, those who raised you. And um, there's a beautiful Talmudic metaphor that Hedy also told me, but that comes from a book by Aaron Appelfeld, uh, sorry, by Aaron Feldman, sorry, sorry. Um, it's called the river, the kettle and the bird. And these are three states of peace, three kinds of peace that we can have with people. I'm gonna share them and you are gonna see which are the ones that you are currently in. This is taken from a passage in the Talmud, which says, that one who dreams of a river, a kettle, or a bird can look forward to peace. These are three symbols of peace because they represent three possibilities of human relationships. Level one of peace is the absence of conflict. This state exists when two people maintain contact with each other 
to the extent that it serves their interests. Each member in this kind of peace is a separate and distinct and discrete unit. The symbol of this kind of peace is a river. A river is a classic vehicle of commerce between two cities. And as such, it represents a state of communication which exists between two separate entities that are connected only by their mutual benefits. State one. Piece number two is where two people join together to reach a common goal that neither one would be able to reach alone. And this represents the type of peace which is dynamic, that results in achievement of an objective. It's a type of peace that you would symbolize with a kettle. The kettle is designed to prepare food by utilizing the combined talents, the combined talents of water and fire. Water alone ruins the food through soaking, but fire alone burns it. The kettle makes it possible a proactive peace between fire and water. State three of peace comes with the bird. The bird is simultaneously earthbound and airborne. A bird represents an embodiment of peace where two natures, airborne and earthbound, two natures and, of, and two entities have merged into one. In this kind of peace, the two parties not only work together, but in doing so, they have merged into one. When we have challenging conversations, part of our essential skill is to know if this is going to be, if we're aiming for, let's put it more like that, for a river, for a kettle, or for a bird. So you ask yourself, what is realistic and essential for you in your relationship at this moment? A river, a kettle, or a bird? And where would you like to go? I'm gonna stop right here and leave you with this metaphor. The river that keeps the two entities apart, the kettle that brings the fire and the water together, and the bird that merges two natures of earth and air. I think that we can pretty much envision many, many of our relationships and our conversations at these three levels of harmony. All right, on to you. Your questions, your comments, your reactions, and the chat box explodes. How do we deal with the situation when someone doesn't want that difficult conversation? My parents have a more conservative view on relationships and a more contemporary one. It's a, more a debate conversation than a dialogue. How do I tackle such an important subject? How do we compromise without letting go of who we are? Fantastic. All right, let me try to go a little bit with, when your partner doesn't want to have a difficult conversation, um, I think the first thing is often to just, if, if, I don't know if it's a partner or someone, it says you're someone. But I think the first thing is really to say, um, it seems like you don't see much value in this. I'm curious how you've come to think that these conversations are not worthwhile. Start with that. Don't start about the conversation. It's the conversation about the conversation. Why not? Has there something I've done? Is it something that you've experienced in other places? You know, is it because you're afraid that you would get angry? Is it because you think you would never be understood? Is because where does this renunciation come from? So that's the first thing. And then from there, you can begin to have a conversation about that. If your parents have different views about relationships, I think that this is a really important one. But here's the thing. The most important thing is not for you to highlight your difference and your contemporary view. The most important thing is for you to actually highlight some of the fundamental things that you believe in that you got from them. So if it is kindness, if it is integrity, if it is respect, if it is sharing, if it is generosity, those things don't have to do with if it's contemporary or traditional. So you start with that. Instead of having a chat about, you know, today marriage is not for life, or today you should not have 10 children, or today you should have sex before you marry, or to, you know, whatever the thing, um, 
actually start by saying, you know, here are the things that are really important to me and that I would love to thank you for because you are the root of why I care about these things. I got it from you, from grandma, from you, from our family, from our tradition, whatever is the thing that they're trying to defend and for you to take with them. So that's the bridge you cross, is highlighting the things that you take from them with you that are also informing whatever contemporary view you may have after with that. I hope that is clear because that's a super important one and a, and a rather easy one actually to, to implement. I overthink and I'm trying not to intellectualize emotions. The pandemic is making it harder. How can we build up emotional energy to even begin the conversation when we feel so threatened? Look, I, you know, um, I think you start with that. You just say, look, um, I feel much more stressed. I'm owning this. I feel more stressed. I think we are much more irritable. I feel overwhelmed. I don't always know that I'm going to be able to, have, to, to do this conversation really well. And I always say, it's possible to say, I've reached the limit. Yesterday, I taught this man, you know, tell her when you come, because he ends the conversation, it's on me. Okay, and then she thinks, okay, he's done. Now there's no conversation anymore. And he feels like it's all his fault, which it's not. And I just said, why don't you just simply say, I think I've reached my limit for this conversation right now. Can we continue it later? I, I want to be here fully when we discuss this. And if we continue right now, I'm going to check out. You know, monitor yourself and tell the other person when you know that you can't really be in, be in the frame if you want. So intellectualizing, you know, um, it's a good exercise for you to really cultivate an emotional vocabulary. I feel, and just start writing. And if you have the word that after I feel, you probably know that what follows is a thought and not a feeling. And often it's a thought about something else than you. I feel that you, I feel that the world, I feel that, you know. A feeling is a basic. I feel loss, hurt, anger, jealousy, envy, joy, sadness. That's feelings. And the very nice way to do it, which I really love the way that every man does, is you just basically start with your body. I feel a tension in my throat. I feel a, a pulsation in my neck. I feel a kind of a, a, a knot in my stomach. I feel my shoulders a little bit. I feel, start with your body, scan your body. It will speak to you. And then you turn, you turn from the sensate focus, from the body focus, from the sensory, into the emotional and from the emotional into the action. That is the step by which you will learn to translate intellectual to, to emotional, which isn't devoid of intellectual, by the way. These two coexist all the time. How do I compromise without letting go of who we are? Look, this is the thing, right? It's like, how, how do you hold on to your belief and come close to the beliefs of others that may be completely different? about all the big issues, you know, love, sex, children, death, money. I mean, this you can, politics, race, all of it goes in there. The most important thing to know is it's not because you open yourself up, because you listen, because you reflect back, because you take in, that it means that, um, that, you, that, that you're going to lose yourself. Uh, you know, death penalty. I mean, we can charge the, th the plate here with this major one. How can I be talking to someone who believes in the death penalty? You do, you pay attention, you listen to it. You will continue to think that you agree with it or not, whatever your viewpoint, but you're going to say, I wanna understand how people come to that conclusion. And if it's your brother, I need to understand how my brother who grew up like me and went to schools like this and da, 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 finds himself, you know, whatever, on this side of the political spectrum, that side of the political spectrum, you know, um, I. I, I, that's one piece. And then the other piece of how you maintain your integrity is by actually focusing not only on what they think or what they vote or what they fund, but also on your connection to them. And that's where the difference lies between family members and other people. You can let go of friends. You can let go of colleagues. You can let go of strangers that you meet. You don't have a loyalty to them. You, that, your relationship exists you know, in a, with different rules than the family relations. Um, you may still go and sit at Thanksgiving with those people who you think have completely different views than you of the world. But you may still think that they are kind people or 
generous people or warm people, regardless or despite or including their views. And that they hopefully think the same about you or you wouldn't be invited at the table. How does one find peace when the other party is disinterested or uninvested? You don't. You don't find peace. You probably get a peace that is more like the river. You see what are the things that you have in common and for which you need to function, to accomplish tasks, to share responsibilities, but you don't do any merging of identities nor any merging of meanings. You just do merging of to-dos. Um, that is a piece that is called the river. Uh, you transport goods from one place to another uh, because both of you need those goods. Um, and that's the kind of piece that you have. It's not a piece in the sense that I think I, I see you would like to have. Um, it, is, um, it is just mutual benefit, shared interest. What is the best way to ask questions about an issue going on in a relationship without one partner feeling interrogated under pressure or accused? Exactly this, I would love to ask you. And I find myself not able to do it without thinking that I may come across as accusing or interrogating or pressuring. You can write it, you can do exactly that. I would love to ask you this. And every time I think about asking you that, I realize that I, I can't see my way out of it. I can't see this being a conversation that, that, um, that you would be comfortable having with me and that I really want to have with you. You can say it, you can write it. And you don't say you will feel pressure, you will feel interrogated. You will say you will experience me as pressuring you or interrogating you. And is there some way that I could speak about this with you that would be better for you? How, what can I do for you to be able to be in this conversation with me. Now, you may say, why shall I? Because it's an enlightened self-interest, because you want to have the conversation, so you need to know what it is you can do in order for your partner not to shut down or close the door on you or tell you we're not talking about this or I'm done. And that's why you want to know, what can I do? And that, a big piece of it, you know, there's a great book, it's, uh, it's called uh, We Need to Talk. But the thing I always remember about this book is that right from the front, the first question is not about what, the first question is how long. So you can always start by saying, you know, I want to dedicate five minutes to this because I know that this is not an easy thing for us to talk about. So it's going to be five minutes and you freaking put a, a timer. Um, so there's an end, it's framed, and rather than it starts and it's two o'clock in the morning. What's the best way to respond when feeling triggered? You clench your fist, you go to the bathroom, you take a deep breath, you start to sing a song inside, you text to somebody that you know is on the same page as you, 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 you just rub your hands against each other in this way, um, you put your head here, that's another way. And you breathe simply. You close your eyes for a moment. You try to be discreet about it if you can't. You just say, you know, and you talk to yourself. This was a tough one to swallow. I really, you know, in me, I can tell you, if I work with patients sometimes and I'm triggered, I do this. I realize I've leaned forward. I'm like, no, 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 Perel, move back. Sit and put your back, that's for you to put your back against the, the rest of the seat, you know, because this is like, I want to charge at you. I want to get in there. I want to drill. And this is, let me just create a boundary for a moment, some space. And please don't answer. Don't answer, you know, and just simply say, I get your point. Or something that says nothing, but that basically is punctuation. That's what we call punctuation in conversations. Can you merge identities if you and your partner share opposite views on major things like religions? So me personally, I don't really look at merging of identities. I don't, you don't, merging is really the absolution of the boundary in between. You merge when you make love temporarily for a moment. It's this real union. And then after that, you basically reconstitute yourself into separate people. Uh, you don't merge identities. I think that that is what people have done with God. That is what people do in the erotic. It's that temporary merging for a moment in order to then come back to oneself. It's a self and other relationship that I am much more interested in. But 
here's the thing. People who come from different religions, if they are both religious, often have a lot more in common than, um, than people who have one person who is develop, uh, deeply secular and a person who is much more devout. That's really interesting. It's not the nominal religion that actually creates the difference. It's the worldview as a whole. Two religious people from different religions often understand each other very well. They may fight each other, they may fight each other for land, they may fight each other for power, but they understand each other very, very well. Whereas secular people that locate responsibility you know, in themselves more versus religious people who think that their life is not only in their own hands, but also in the faith and in the hands of God, that is often a much bigger difference. The two people who have a different God, but still think that God has them, their well-being in their hands are much more connected. Um, that's a very important piece on, on difference. And here's the thing, as a whole, difference is not what makes the conversation difficult. People can have difference like the princess and the pea, a tiny bit of difference, and it's already considered like earth shattering. It's how the people deal with the difference, how they experience it. I cannot believe that my own husband, brother, boyfriend, you know, partner, best friend would think like that. It's that mentality. I can't believe that you, who I love, who I need, who I care about, who I grew up with, could come and have such, what does it say about me that I have to deal with somebody like you? It's sort of those sentences that make difference so charged, so threatening, so unsettling or triggering. Um, they can be about women, they can be about children, they can be about climate. I mean, I can, the list of things that we can disagree about is, is enormous. But it's really interesting how sometimes people can be deeply connected and friends with people who have entirely different views, especially childhood friends. Now, you may not become friends again with these people today, if you met them now, but because you have history with them, the history dilutes the history adds other pieces to the connection that isn't just about the fact that they vote different, they see the world different, they see danger different, even though those things are very big. And then sometimes you say, we have nothing left in common. We have nothing more to talk about. We really want different things, value different things. And it matters to me to be with people who share similar values, okay? I want integrity. I don't want somebody who lies and cheats. That's a difference of values. It's less about who you voted for or which article you find has the truth for you. I work through my emotions verbally and my husband works them through them silently. How do we deal with these two communication styles? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. One talks, one listens. One talks less and then maybe has something to say or um, puts a hand on your shoulder or gives you a big smile, or makes you breakfast the next day, or, um, you know, and on occasion, you may want to say to your husband, I know that you're not a talker. Um, I need a tiny bit more. Can you write it for me? Can you just say three words? Can you, you know, just let me know where that landed on you. Um, is this, you know, where, 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 where did we end up here? Don't try to make your husband a talker, or your husband try to make you more silent. I think, it's the recognition of this and the management of that difference, not the actual difference. You know, um, is your talking problematic for him? Is it hard for, because you talk too much, too long, and he gets overwhelmed, flooded? Is it that you talk and you want more reaction from him? Is it that you want the same kind of reaction from him as you do, which is you want him to talk back? Is it that he doesn't talk because he thinks, what's the point? She doesn't listen. She will cut me off at the first thing she disagrees with. Or is it that he's never really found talking so important? Yesterday, this couple, you know, she, she talks a lot more. And I think that she has a way of picking up on the one thing that, that is, wasn't fully elaborated from him. And she will beat him to the punch. She's much more articulate. She's, but then she says to him, but I can see you talking with other people. But other people don't cut him off. Other people don't correct him. <coughs> so... The issue is not that you're a talker or more of a talker than him. What is it that your talking does to him? What is it that his silence does to you? 
and can you fine tune it a little bit? It's like dials that you just fine tune because you would be different people with, with others. And by the way, when you are with a silent person, you become more of a talker. And when a silent person is with a talker, they become more silent. Typically, we become a more extreme version of ourselves over time because we are with somebody who is different and who is actually making us become more of the specific thing that is already us. That is a very interesting thing. We don't become over time more like the other. We over time become more of an extreme version of what we started out with. That's also a very interesting piece of data here. How do you have a conversation you know will cause the other sadness? You say, I, this may be a tough conversation. I can't bear the thought of how painful this may be for you. I know this is gonna hurt you badly, but I have to do it. If you, you know, interestingly, nobody says, how do you have a conversation you know will make somebody else laugh? We are okay with that. You know, well, we should also, it's harder. It's much harder, but it is part of you, your care. You say caringly, I know it's gonna make you really sad. We won't be seeing your mother this summer. We will not be having another child. Uh, I lost the child we had. Um, I lost the money we had. I this or that, whatever, you know, um, I want to leave you. I don't love you the same way. Um, it's extremely difficult. We resist them. We, we avoid them as much as we can. And yet, if we simply could say, I know this is going to really make you sad or hurt you or disappoint you, and I know it, and yet I respect you too much not to say this. And then you try. And that's the courage that we need. We need skills, essential skills for difficult conversation, and then we need the courage. And I think that when you ask the question, you already have a piece of the courage, because you know, you, you kind of know what you need to do. You can rehearse it. You can write it and then bring it and read it out loud. Sometimes that really helps. Um, you can you know, make sure that the other person is well supported before you tell them some really painful truths, things like that. And I think on this note, I'm gonna let you go. Is there any big question I did not answer here? What is the best way about an issue without one partner? Yeah, we did that. Family is incredible. Ah, my family, is dealing with incredible anger during this time. How do we transform that anger? How do you be authentic without worrying about hurting other, other people's feelings? I'm gonna just go with the, with the anger because we just spoke about the sadness and the anger kind of lives on the other side of that. I think that the one at the table who is able to take the anger and to say, we are all afraid or we are all really disappointed, or we are all sad about this thing, and we feel helpless about it. And we really are upset that they took our land away, that they, you know, the, 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 you know that there is no acknowledgement of what we've been trying to say, that, um, that we're struggling the way we are, that, whatever the that is. Um, and we are all angry. And then, but we also have other feelings and it's interesting. We're all much more able to bicker and pick at each other than to actually um, hold each other's hand at a time when we really need each other. And this is a truth that happens in a lot of families at this moment as well. The one who can do it is the leader of the house. So I invite you to become the leaders of your house, this type of leadership, the empathic leadership. Be well, everybody. I'll see you next month. You go to estherperel.com slash blog. You read the newsletter. We join together. We discuss the newsletter. And we all gain in reflection, in action, in confidence, and in relational intelligence. Till then, bye.